when you have a small dollar amount, you should not be investing in blue chip companies. When you have these little manias and bubbles popping up where if you ride it, even for just a little bit, you can grow your account exponentially. All right, today with me, I've got the guy who made penny stocks famous. This man has trained thousands and thousands of students, he even told me he had a student go from 1500 to 15 million, which obviously no results guaranteed, but that's a crazy story. He is also, just in the short amount of time talking to him, I didn't realize he had such a heart for charity, over a hundred schools built in other countries. He just gave me a brand new sweater. I'm gonna rock from his charity. And uh, it's hard to get him in one place because he's traveling 30 plus countries a year. And uh, I got him on the show. Tim Sykes, what's up, man? Hey, thanks for having me. Big Did people, fan. Do you ever go by Tim or just Timothy? I'm Timothy online because some bastard had timsykes.com when I first started. <laughs> so I had to be like Timothy, but then he forgot to renew it one year. And I was like at a club at two in the morning. I got like an alert and I got it for like 10 bucks. He wanted to charge me like 50 grand. Oh. He's like, this has value. And I'm like, I'm not paying you. I don't negotiate. I'm with the terrorists. only guy who would value it. Yeah. But he forgot to renew it one year. So I was at, the, at this club. I remember this in Miami and I got an alert on my phone. It was like, this is available. Got it. My 10 bucks. Tim Sykes is back. <laughs> but I, Timothy was already too big. So now everyone now calls Timothy. me Timothy. Yeah. yeah. I uh, bought RyanPineda.com when I was nobody for 900 bucks. Nice. Yeah. That's a good deal. It, it was a good deal. Shoot. I should have bought it. I would have <laughs> I would have well, been I, the other side. I just bought a bunch of domains this year for like our company. Like I bought WealthyInvestor.com for 10 grand. Okay. And, you know, that's the most I've spent on a website. But. I have problems with domains. I I buy too many. I'm like drunk in like buying them because I have these ideas. I might use this one day. Yeah. Like I, I bought like I bought pennygump.com. I'm like, oh, I'm going to do a whole series like, you know, penny stock. I was going to do like a Forrest Gump impression. I was like, penny stocks are not hard. And I was like, why would I even do that? It's such a bad idea. Yeah. Well, you told me you were going to dye your hair purple. But yeah. You didn't like, you sounded like you were somewhat serious too. I, I planned on it. I was like, going to like come on the show and be like, yo, we got the same hair, but you don't have purple hair. And I ran out of time. So it's all good. I saw you wear a construction outfit. I wore that. That was my outfit at the Thrive Conference last year. <laughs> I literally wore a construction outfit in November of 2021. And everyone's like, what are you doing? I was like, a crash is coming. You got to prepare. And I gave a whole hour long talk on why a crash was coming. And I was right. You were right. I'm sad about it. I didn't want to be right, but I felt like, you know, when there's too much extreme in any market, whether it's real estate, stocks, crypto, like it comes down. There's yeah. there's a return to when, when sanity. The, the, the hysteria is just crazy. But on the same token, like when there's a mania, like you have to push it. Like I underestimated the mania. I totally missed out on crypto, missed out on NFTs. Yeah. Because I was like, no, this doesn't seem logical to me. But sometimes you got to be like, okay, let me ride the hype a little bit. Right. I always have problems doing that. Well, and you're into day trading too. So yeah. it's like, it is hype driven and news driven, right? It's all news driven and hype driven. But again, like with, you know, we were talking off camera before, like we know every penny stock crashes. Like it's not a question, right? <laughs> like same thing with like crypto and NFTs. Like we know all of these charts, we know they're going to crash, but you don't know how high they're going to go in the meantime. And, you know, you can ride the hype. Like people with small accounts should use speculative markets, speculative assets to grow their small amounts. So do you believe in like long-term stocks at all or Bitcoin? <sighs> It's so tough. I mean, I personally can't do it because I just don't have the patience. Um, you know, my favorite trading strategy is buying on a Friday, selling on a Monday, and it's only because the stock market is closed <laughs> on the weekend. So I'm like, oh, I'm holding for three days. Yeah. Um, it's tough. It, it's never paid to bet against America for any extended period of time. But if you also look just historical comps, like we're so overvalued in so many ways still, even after 2022. Right. Yeah. So for those who don't know you, I mean, obviously you're, you're the penny stock guy. Um, you, you've trained lots of students. How did you even get started in all this? Um, you know, my parents gave me control of my bar mitzvah money, 12 grand. Um, I was a tennis player already into college, early admission. So I'm just sitting there. I had uh, surgery on my arms because I, I overtrained. Wait, you, wait, your bar mitzvah money, don't you? Aren't you 13? Yeah, it was just sitting. It was sitting in like an account. And so like this was senior year of high school. Oh, you got it way yeah, later. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. I was just sitting there. My parents were like, here, put it in the stock market. My dad actually confessed later. He's like, I thought you would just lose it all and it'd be like a good lesson, like the value of a dollar. But I got obsessed with trading. I started investing in big companies. I like I invested in Boston Celtics, uh, Super Cuts, I didn't know you could buy into the Boston Celtics. <laughs> well, they had a, they used to have a stock. Oh. Um, so I bought them, you know, I'm a Knicks fan, but like my dad was Boston. So I was like, okay, I'll, you know, 
I'll buy it for you. And the, my account went nowhere for months. These companies would barely budge. Right. And so I gravitated towards lower price stocks, penny stocks. This was 1999, good timing, because I was there for the bubble. And I would just buy penny stocks and they were double, triple, quadruple. My first successful strategy, you wanna know how dumb it is? Companies would add a dot com to their corporate name. Okay. So that was it. This is when the internet was beginning. I would see Sportsman's Guide. They sell camping gear online. They changed their name. They put out a press release. Sportsman's Guide is now sportsmansguide.com. And the stock would go from like three to 12 <laughs> in like four days. Not like all at once either. Like I'm, right. I like, you know, holding day one, day two. And every company that added .com, like it worked like 100% of the time. I was like, this is so stupid. But that's what happened. And then there was also the Y2K bug. Everyone, remember the Y2K bug? Were you even born then? I, I was there. I was around. I remember they thought the whole world was going to crash, like everything was going to shut down. So all these companies said, yeah. we have the solution. We have the solution. Put out a press release again, 5, 10, 20 times in a few days. So I'm, I'm used to this. All the dot-coms crashed. All the Y2Ks crashed. Like I've seen the booms before. This sounds like NFTs before NFTs. Very similar, right? It so, just sounds like so hype driven and just, oh, this sounds pretty dumb. Like let's roll. You get these like momentary lapses of, of logic in the markets. And again, people want to hate on it, but like people with small accounts should really focus on this and learn from history. This has been going on for hundreds of years. You know, you had the tulip bubble, I think it was what, the 1500s, yeah. 1600s. You had the South Sea bubble. I mean, there's so many bubbles that pop up this is really the only way to grow a small account, but you have to know how it ends. So I say ride the hype, just never believe it. Mm. So how do you know when to get out? <laughs> That's my problem. I always sell too soon. Um, like, Oh, you have the opposite problem I have. What? I just hold. Oh, yeah. I'm, I'm just like, oh, it's going to keep going. It's going to keep going. It, I get greedy. Sometimes it does, but like I've just seen so many crashes and like, so I take singles. So like I, my average gain, I take like five, 10, 15, 20%. And then the stocks usually spikes like 40, 50%, sometimes like a hundred percent. And all like, even my, my top students make fun of me because I'm like the conservative penny stock guy. They're like, what? But that's just the way that it is. And that's how I've personally made, you know, $7 million now. But probably if I had more patience, it could have been like 20, but it's okay. Either way, it's a life-changing amount of money. Yeah, I mean, who knows what, it, you might've lost a lot Correct, too, right? 100%. It's a very fine line, right? Like yeah. you have this hype, but then if you start to believe it, this is the key, right? So like, if you believe it, you never know when to get out. Like I know crypto people, I know one guy, really sad, he started with 50,000, um, went up to 20, Two million dollars, <laughs> fifty thousand twenty-two, and I'm like, just, just take just some, take just take some. And he, his whole logic was because I, I was telling him like when he was at five million, at ten million, I'm like, yo, sell, 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 and he won't do it. And because he held so long, he learned the wrong lessons. He's like, no, if I sell, like I was like, just take out a million, you'll still have you know twenty plus million in there, but that way you take some out just in case. But he's like, no, if I sell a million, that could be worth ten million in a year from now at the current pace. So he didn't want to lose the 9 million. Now it's back down to 100,000. Mm. He went all the way up. He's still he's still up as he reminds me, right. which is just stupid. <laughs> it's very stupid. That's just ridiculous. And I know a lot of crypto and NFT people. Like you got to lock in the profits. That's that's my one goal in life. Yeah. Even if you're too early, even if you're too late, like it's not a, a perfect science. Right. Yeah, I think about that now that I've been in so I'm in crypto and I've been in two cycles now, 2017 and, you know, 2021. And, you know, I wrote it like I, I was up, you know, a million bucks and then it just went down. Yeah. Just, I, I just hold. I'm just like, I don't have the patience to watch charts or news or anything. I'm like, I'm going to buy Bitcoin because I like Bitcoin. I think it's good. Right. And I'm going to buy certain NFTs because I think NFTs are good and, and for whatever this reason is. But um, now that I'm thinking about it, having watched it go up and down twice now and to see just the lulls of like crypto is very predictable. It's like. Yeah, it, it goes on a tear for it a cycles. year and then for three years it's dead yeah. and then it tears again. And I'm like, all right, I'm saving up for this next tear because it's going to like you could 50x something. It's It depends if you like roller coasters and you have to know your limits, right? right. So like you ride it. And for me, I just don't like it. Like I, I don't like staying too long. I right. don't mind being too early. I really don't mind. This is also why I became a teacher. I was like, I'm better at teaching this stuff than I am at trading. You know, like teachers are those who can't do. That's me. <laughs> which is fine. I accept it. You know, several of my students have made more than me in like half the time. Fantastic. Yeah. You know, I mean, that's you just got to know your value. When your, your students go better than you. Well, you have to know your value and you have to know your, you know, 
your weaknesses. Like I've never been good at very, very good at math or like Excel spreadsheets. My top students have like the strategies, they have the formulas, Algorithms, they have all of this stuff. Everything. I don't, I don't even have ex one Excel spreadsheet. I've never made an Excel spreadsheet. I'm always like judging it because again, I've, I've seen so many of these plays. I have a photographic memory, which helps. So I remember price action and charts, but it's not exact in my mind. These guys are taking size with their trades because they say, okay, you know, buying the first green day pattern, which is a common pattern that we use when there's a stock up 20, 30% with news, it usually spikes like 14% in the next hour of the second day. And they have all these formulas and is back tested over several years. So they can size up because of the confidence that the data gives them. I never had that. Right. You just go off gut, it sounds yeah, like. Yeah. Yeah. A hundred percent. So for me, it's like, yeah, a lot of it is just teaching the basics, like seeing enough booms and busts. That's, that's cool and sad, but also seeing what many traders do. Like 90% of traders lose 70% of investors don't even beat the S and P 500 every year. So I'm like, wait a minute, this is like a massive industry of BS, right? Like people who teach online about the stock market, yeah. like it's snake oil salesmen, right? Like I have the secret to making millions. Yeah, I yeah. will teach you. And it's like, let me actually do it in a real conservative, blunt way. Let me upend all these ignorant assumptions. Like, don't follow any chat rooms. You know, there's all these chat rooms where they like, they all like- I saw those guys got popped. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So he, you know, Zach Morris was his like online screen name. He, yeah. he made a video about me because I was ripping on him and all of his crew. I was like, these are just promoters. And he made a video and he's like, screw you, Tim Sykes. I'm coming to your event. I called him like a cokehead promoter. <laughs> right. And I, I made a joke. I was like, you know, everyone's asking, like, are these pumps that they're promoting going to come back? And I was like, well, it really depends on your promoter's drug dealer. Like if he doesn't have enough Coke, he's angry. He's he's like going to you know be more aggressive in pumping. If he's too much Coke, then he's useless. He might not you know promote at all. So I was like, it's it's a fine line. But I was just like egging them on because, you know, a lot of promoters ever since Jordan Belfort do a lot of drugs. Yeah, so I, I have to teach like the whole promotion aspect of it so that people get de-brainwashed from like believing in this because right. they, they literally just believe in it. They don't realize there's a promoter. They don't realize that the company's diluting shares. Like I have to kind of teach how this, you know, niche works. Mm. And that works in, in, you know, NFTs and crypto too. Like you see all this shadiness out there. You got to call it out or at least like keep your eyes open. Right. So you, you start in 99, you, yep. you're just wheeling and dealing. How did, how did your career progress as you were doing this? So freshman year of college, um, well, senior year of high school, I made over a hundred grand, which was a lot for me. I grew up like middle class. Freshman year of college, 700 grand. And I had like three fake IDs taken away. I was like really thin. I was like in my dorm room, like downloading illegal movies on Merck. Like <laughs> I was like this little loser, but I made 700 grand in a few months. But that was peak bubble. I didn't understand I was right place, right time yeah. in the year 2000. So I'm like extrapolating. I'm like, if I make 700 grand every four months for the rest of my life, and I was like, so, so dumb. I'm going to be a billionaire. Yeah, right? Uh, first four months of 2000, I made 700 grand. Last eight months of 2000, lost 10 grand. There were no more penny stock breakouts. The whole market crashed. I didn't know short selling. So it forced me to learn the other side of the market. 2001, 2002, I made over a million short selling, the same kinds of pumps, but on the way down. So there's like a front side of the move and then there's a, a downside. It's pretty simple, like pump and dump. Um, and this is what like the Atlas crew did. This is what all these promoters do. Um, and, you know, it works. Right. So how long did you basically trade that full time? Like you were still going to school. Did you finish college? Like, why so were you I was taking night classes so I could focus on teaching or uh, trading in the daytime. So at night, literally I'm like with these like ESL students who were like, are working during the day mm -hmm. and I'm working during the day trading. Um, so I started my hedge fund right out of college, senior year of college. Don't do that. That was stupid. <laughs> Cause I was like, let me try to trade. Let me try to go to class. Let me take this meeting. And I couldn't handle it all. Um, almost flunked out, gradually barely made it, um, but missed a lot of trades, missed a lot of meetings, had like a little hedge fund of $3 million for like three years. But back then you weren't allowed to like advertise your returns. Um, so I didn't, I didn't know many people. Like, I don't know rich people, right? I, I, I like get along with like the lower class. I make a lot of like blunt jokes. Uh -huh. um, so like you had to meet rich people, like accredited investors. And I didn't know any, and I wasn't allowed to like publish my returns. So I was like, what do I do? So I went on this reality TV show called Wall Street Warriors in 2006. Okay. And it became a hit. And I was very shy. So on the camera, like I had to like get liquid courage. 
Fortunately, I had gone to school in New Orleans, which gave me some experience in drinking. <laughs> and I was just drunk in every episode. And that was, <laughs> made me funnier. Like we, we played golf in one episode and like I purposely hit the ball into the pond and then I took off my shirt and jumped into the pond. And I'm like, here's my ball. Uh, I still get like emails to this day from golfers being like, screw you, you know, you disrespected <laughs> it. But this show was just a little show on uh, Mojo. It was like the first HD network, but because they didn't have a lot of content, they played it over and over again. Okay. It became like the number one, I heard later it was the number one most downloaded show on like early itunes in like wow. 2008 it was all nerds right and like it was just wall street and you saw my life at that point i you know was living pretty well i had a few million dollars even though my hedge fund wasn't growing um so you see me like partying you see me like going out and all this stuff um and started getting a lot of emails from that show and at the time, again, I'm not allowed to like talk about my numbers publicly. I find it kind of found like a loophole, like, oh, I'm on this reality show. I don't talk about the numbers, but like you see my story, getting all these emails, people can't invest in my hedge fund. They're, they're not rich enough. It's like average. Like, yeah, they're not accredited. Yeah, right? So they're like, I want to learn. And I was like, oh, I, ha I have this hedge fund, but I can't talk about my numbers. My numbers weren't that good. Um, you know, I was making like 20% per year on like 3 million, which is, you know, this is always the problem with penny stocks. I can make a few hundred grand given my conservatism. Right. My top students can make millions because they're more aggressive. Right. But I always like, you know, a few hundred grand. I also invested in my best friend's dad's company at the time, Printed Home Ticketing. I tried to be an investor. I should have brought this up earlier, right? Yeah. I love Printed Home Ticketing. I was like, this is the future. They got a, a contract with Six Flags. You know, you can order online and then print it at the kiosk or print it at home. Dan Shapiro, who was like the CEO of Six Flags at the time, he created ESPN. I went there for like the first little kiosk and he's shaking everyone's hands. He doesn't know I'm an investor in the company. He thinks I'm like an engineer. He's like, this is going to change everything. I put in another hundred grand that day. Long story short, the company goes bankrupt. The technology was there, but they took on too many debts developing it. Um, and that took my hedge fund down. Um, so I was making 20% per year with my conservative trading strategy, lost 35% on this massive long-term investment when I fell in love with the tech. Mm. Then the TV show is popping off, getting all these emails what can I do? I can't talk about my numbers. Even with the loss, I'm still up, but teaching is there. And so I closed down the hedge fund to get into teaching. Everyone's like, you're crazy. You're leaving like a multi-trillion dollar business for like this snake oil business. I'm like, yeah, but I see opportunity. So for me, it's always been about like trying to push it in terms of trading, but understanding my limitations and then talking all about this and digging into it with my teaching. Mm. You know, I talk about all my wins, all my losses, my video lessons on my losses, they do three to four times the number of views because people are like, wow, you talk about your losses. Like, yeah, it's not the end of the world. But most people in my industry, they only post their wins. Like I called this, I called this, I called this. Eh, let's not talk about that. Mm. You know, so I show every single trade online, wins, losses. I had a stupid three grand loss on Friday on Tesla, you know, talked about it openly. People are like, thank you. Tesla keeps dropping as we're filming this is crazy. Have you seen I, it? Yeah, I mean- 107 right now after hours. So I don't trade stocks. I mean, I, I, so I bought stocks one time. This was back in 2020 in March because I was like, there's no way these stocks are this cheap. Like this makes no sense. Yeah. And I just didn't ever buy into the whole COVID narrative. So I kept buying real estate. I bought stocks. And then um, Tesla was my biggest holding. Oh. And obviously it killed it. Yeah. And I sold too early. Yeah, it's good. And, you know, I, I did like double or tripled. Nice. Whatever. And then I just was like, yeah, I'm good. Like, I think now stocks are good. Like <laughs> with no, no judge. I'm just like, dude, I mean, it, it, they all went up to where they were and like, that's what they should have been. Yeah. I mean, that's how you kind of have to look at it. Like, I know there are people with like Excel spreadsheets and formulas and you can take sides with that. But for the average person, like my average person, my average student doesn't do Excel spreadsheets. They're not like in tune enough to do right. that. Um, the average person, you should look for like these panics, like, you know, COVID was a great dip buying opportunity. You look for the giant booms and busts. And if you kind of take like this big picture point of view, you do okay. The scary thing is, like you said, you sold too early, but now, I mean, it's just dropped. Like if you had asked me, like if this had been like a month ago where Tesla dropped from like 300 to like 180, went to the 300s down to the 180 ish. I would have dip bought it just big picture wise, but now we're down to 107. Like you can't, you can't judge the tops and the bottoms. No. Especially, even on a big company like Tesla, like this is shocking to me that it's dropped so much. I don't know what's going on. Is Elon selling more? Is there some controversy brewing? Is it just overvaluation? 
It's crazy. I've never seen this. So I tried to dip by. I broke my rules on Friday, lost three grand, made a video lesson. People loved it. I, I'm at the point where like now it's back to where I'm like, I think I should start buying stocks again. It's tough. Like it's, so I, I'll give you a baseball card analogy. Do you ever collect baseball cards? Of course. So I grew up in Connecticut. You remember Beckett Baseball yep. Card Monthly? It was like a magazine that came out like every month. Mm -hmm. I got obsessed with like baseball cards. I love baseball. I love Ken Griffey Jr. He's my favorite player. Met that was him my favorite player growing up too. Later I met him and it was a giant disappointment. <laughs> I mean, that was one of like my biggest disappointments. I'm, yeah. I was at this charity event, met Michael Jordan, Wayne Gretzky, all awesome. Meet my hero, Ken Griffey Jr. I'm like telling him how like I used to travel to like see him. And he's like, are we done? And I'm like, Wayne Gretzky, Michael Jordan giving me like yeah. 10 minutes each. I was like, Griffey, you're, you're not even, don't get me started. Sorry. <laughs> Anyways, collecting baseball cards because all of like my parents, friends and older people had like regretted not holding on to their like 1950, 1955, their 1950. Wagner. Yeah. Right. Well, like 1952 tops, right? Yeah. Like Mickey Mantle now worth a ton. And so I'm like, oh, let me collect all these baseball cards. So all my like uh, birthday wish list, Hanukkah wish list, we're all like baseball cards. So I got all these baseball cards and I like invested in older ones, like from the seventies and eighties. I was like, Ooh, they're going to appreciate over time. Unfortunately tops, which is like one of the biggest baseball card uh, makers, they just diluted the crap out of everything. They knew the reason why the 1950s tops cards are worth so much is because there's not many left yeah, in good condition. And demand. Well, but people would also put them like in their bikes and they would like, you uh, know, go around like good condition. Like there's a whole new market for like graded cards. Not many cards lasted in good condition. So I'm like, okay, I'm going to beat the game. I'm going to stock up all this stuff from like the 80s and 90s. And I'm going to get all these baseball cards in perfect condition. The problem is Tops knew this. Tops knew that all these kids across America were saving up and buying all these baseball cards. So they just printed millions of them. So baseball cards have not appreciated at all. There's too much dilution. And this is what's happening. And they actually got crushed. Um, this is what's happening with the stock market. This is what's happening with crypto. Like there's a lot of demand, but there's so much supply. Mm. You know, like the whole COVID situation, it was crazy for my business as a teacher and a trader. Like that was the best trading I've seen in decades. I had my first $2 million years in trading. I never, I never had a million dollar year in trading. I always made like a few hundred thousand. Yeah. But in 2020, 2021, I made over a million each. I was trying to push it. Looking back, I was still too conservative. <laughs> um, missed out. But again, I warned, right? And this year, 2022, all the strategies from 2020 and 2021 aren't working. Like people are getting annihilated. Yeah. I'm still green in 2022. So like, mm. you know, I have, I have smaller ups and, and much smaller downs. And it, you get to basically choose what kind of stress level you want to have. Some people mm. like going for home runs. Yeah. They like the thrill. They like the, you know, That's the exhilaration. Me. Yeah. I used to like that, but I actually donate all of my trading profits to charity these days. So this is how I fund the schools. Mm. You know, we sell a little merch, but then it's my trading profits. My partner, Matt Abad, is a photographer. He sells his prints. That gets donated. Um, so for me, the way that I teach is through my trading, but it doesn't benefit me at all if I have a green or red year. Right. That way I can be unbiased and I donate to charity. So it's win-win. Yeah, I don't yeah. just say I donate to charity to like look good. Like it actually helps me in my teaching. So many people like, you know, they have like a chat room and they're like, oh, let me buy this stock. And then they make all this money because they try to get everyone else to follow it. I'm like, never follow anybody in any chat room. I exposed Atlas. I exposed all these promoters. I want to teach patterns mm. and I can be unbiased all my trades, you know, trading profits are good. I want to have trading profits, but it doesn't benefit me personally. Yeah. No, I love that. So at what point, it sounds like around 2008, after the show, they started uh, emailing you like about the show and all these people are wanting to learn. And is that when you started um, doing education? Yeah. So I uh, got started teaching late 2007. Everyone thought I was crazy because hedge funds were so hot. But again, like I, I never really got along like, with like rich people, like, I don't know if you know a lot of rich people, mm -hmm. like a lot of them are just boring and, <laughs> and like, you can't make like, you know, crash jokes. I make a lot of crash jokes. <laughs> um, so I had to like find my people. Right. And yeah. I found my people like in teaching and like, and now I, I don't have to walk on eggshells. Um, you know, that's just me. So right. I, I love teaching, you know, my average student has like two or $3,000 to their name. 
I remember when I was in that position, I mean, I had 12,000, but like my top student, Tim Gratani started with 1500. My newest, hottest student, Jack Kellogg is from Connecticut um, too. So we call ourselves Connecticut boys. Mm -hmm. Former valet started with just a few thousand from his valet tips. Now he's over 10 million. Wow. But also understand this, like I talk about like my best students, they have no lives whatsoever. Like they are totally dedicated. They have their Excel spreadsheets. They're back testing all their results but they're also using the money to take care of their family. Like Tim Gratani now has two children, mm -hmm. uh, him and Donna, I used to like travel with them before the kids. Now it's tough to travel with kids as you yeah, might, I know. might know. <laughs> um, all my friends are having kids, but I'm, I'm just married to my job. Married to the game. Yeah. Baby. I see more opportunity. Like there's still so much BS out there. Um, you know, people are still losing now, even like in Tesla, I'm getting so many emails from people in Tesla. Like, what do I do? Wow. And I'm like, I don't know, to, to tell you the <laughs> truth. No, I don't. Like, I, I know penny stock promos. I know hype charts. I, I'm shocked at how much Tesla is going down, but I was also shocked at how much it was going up. You know, I don't know everything about every company at all times. I know my patterns. Mm -hmm. And if it's not my patterns, it's a guessing game. Yeah, I mean, that's such the interesting thing about stocks is like, you know, it's just so market perception based. It's like the fundamentals of Tesla haven't changed. <laughs> They're the same company. They're still like, full self-driving, you know, they're developing new things. It's just like, that's why I never understood stocks. It's very fragile, right? Where like it's perception is reality. Um, you know, some of my best plays are buying companies that already have news, but many people haven't read the news already. Like I'll, I'll give you an example. Last time I was in Vegas, I was doing like a boot camp uh, with like 50 students and it was the Roe v. Wade got overturned. Uh -huh. um, and so I'm looking for plays. I was like, oh, how is this, you know, no matter what you believe, how is this going to benefit any company? And I find this company, EVFM, uh, they have like this um, this upcoming product that can help females with, with this issue. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, this is like a, a play. Or this is a female contraceptive play. The stock was up 25% on the Roe v. Wade overturning because now theoretically their product is going to have more potential. But I was like, this is like a once in a decade type court ruling. This is going to be big for this little company. So this is on a Friday and I see it. It's not closing that strong. I'm like, well, let me see if, you know, writers are going to write about it on the weekend. Like sometimes like journalists mm -hmm. don't write about it the same day. Journalists make like 30, 40, 50 K a year. Yeah. They're not like on top of things all the time. Right? right. Right. So I buy the stock on a Friday in front of everyone at my boot camp. Hardly anyone even pays attention. They're like, yeah, Tim, it's not up that much. Like we normally buy stocks that are up like 30, 50, 70% in the day. So 20 are a momentum trade. Yeah, 100%. Okay. But if it's up 25%, like it's up, it's a big percent gainer, but it's not like that exciting. And it wasn't closing that strong. No one was that excited. And I was like, well, maybe there'll be some news. On Saturday, on Sunday, tons of news about this, like follow up. They bring up the stock, stock doubles on Monday. I sell immediately. I lock in my profits, like right when the market opens. Tuesday, it doubles again. So I sold too early. But like, it shocked me that, you know, normally I'm not trading in front of people, but it shocked me that no one in the audience, and these are some of my best students, no one saw the potential for it to keep running because they're just looking at the price action on Friday. They mm. didn't think how important the overturning of Roe v. Wade, they didn't think about how like journalists are going to write about it over the weekend, then other people are going to see it on Monday. Right. So I'm always trying to think like, okay, there's news, but then people need to see the news, people need to digest it, people will act on the news, mm -hmm. right? So like right now, I think Tesla is just dropping because... I mean, there's, there's so many cross currents. Like they said that they're slowing up in China, which is one thing. Uh, there's like a COVID outbreak there. Elon now is focused on Twitter. Right. There's a, a whole bunch of stuff. And then there's tax law selling, now margin calls. Mm. I don't know. You know, this is they, they, a lot of people say it's just margin calls. You, this is the problem with like leverage. You don't know how many margin calls there are. You don't know the boom and the bust. Like FTX was a solid business in itself, the brokerage business. The problem was they had all these different loans and they have all this, you know, sketchy yeah. stuff. Like leverage is very scary, especially when when you start to try to pull back the layers. Yeah, somebody, I was watching a video, they were saying FTX was trading at like 100x leverage with Alameda. Yeah, I, all the greatest financial busts in history are due to leverage. Jesse Livermore, do you know Jesse Livermore? No. Greatest trader ever made basically a few billion back in like 1900, 1910. <laughs> yeah, like literally so much money. He's like racing yachts with Walter P. Chrysler. If I ever make enough, I'll make a movie based on his life. But in the 1930s, he thought that he had found the bottom of the market. He took on a whole bunch of leverage, got wiped out. He mm -hmm. was within 5% of the bottom in the market. 
But because of his leverage, he was wiped out, eventually lost all of his money, like a decade later, committed suicide. Wow. This is one of the greatest traders of all time. And he used too much leverage and he was right there within 5%. So when you're using leverage, it's such a fine line because if you're off by a little bit, you get wiped out and then things can just move like crazy fast. So mm. I don't, I don't, I never use leverage. Mm. I, I like being conservative. Hey, if you're looking to grow your real estate investing business, whether you're just getting started trying to get your first deal or you're trying to scale and get to the next level, you need to join us at Wealthy Investor. We've got events every single quarter that are absolutely crazy. We've got online coaching programs where we have Zoom calls, a community every single week. We give you everything you need to know to start your business, scripts, processes, SOPs, all of it. It's for you so that you can dominate. So if you wanna learn more about how to join our community and be mentored by me and some of our top coaches and be around other students who are absolutely crushing it, Go to WealthyInvestor.com, apply for a free call with my team. Once again, WealthyInvestor.com, apply for a call today. I'm gonna be honest with you guys, the smartest business decision I've ever made was creating content. Ever since then, my businesses have skyrocketed, not only because we get a lot of views and we're able to turn those views into leads, which then turn into dollars, but it's also led to a ton of different business opportunities, investors, and also it's allowed me to hire A-plus employees all because I made the decision to create content. Now, here's the thing. Most people have no idea where to begin. That changes with Wealthy Creator. Wealthy Creator is my coaching program for entrepreneurs who want to grow their personal brand on social media. And if you're listening to this, that's probably you. You probably realize you should be creating a podcast just like this one and developing your personal brand. We can help you. We have coaching programs, mentorships. In fact, we can even edit your content for you and run your social media account. It's absolutely crazy. So if you wanna learn more about it, go to wealthycreator.io. You can book a free call with my team. So once again, that's wealthycreator.io. Start creating content today, building that brand, and I promise you, it'll be the best investment you ever make. Yeah, I wanna, I wanna learn more about kind of your methods, but I wanna jump into the, the charities. Yeah. Like what inspired you to do that? Um, so, you know, I had always been traveling thanks to, you know, my, my trading profits. I love traveling. I grew up in a small town, so I always wanted to see the world, yeah. was able to do that. But once you get over seeing the world and seeing all this luxury and all the tourist stuff, you're like, okay, what's, what, what more do you want? Right? Like I had all my cars. I, you know, I was like the original douchebag online, <laughs> like business week had an article. It was like douchebag marketing. It was the first time they ever used douchebag in like a it title a picture of you. for me. It is. It was me and my orange Lambo, right? <laughs> This was me. And so I, I was like, I wasn't. And you were doing it just for the marketing? Yeah, purely. Yeah. I actually wanted a black Lambo, but it sold out like the day before I got it. And well, I the was orange like, is better for marketing anyway. I know. As it turned out, I became like the orange Lambo guy. But I thought yeah. the black one, I was going to be like Batman. I was going to be, <laughs> it didn't work. Um, anyways, I had this, you know, Business Week features me. So I have all these luxuries. I have this stuff, but like, it gets boring. Like, I'll tell you this, one of the worst days of my life, and this sounds terrible. I know how it sounds my second Lambo gets delivered. <laughs> okay. I feel nothing. First Lambo, I'm jumping. I'm like, childhood dream, yes. Second one, I'm like, oh my God, what's wrong with me? I think I have cancer. I'm like, what's, I take like a $10,000 cancer test. I'm like, you know, something's wrong with me. I didn't have cancer. I just didn't get the adrenaline rush anymore. So, you know, for me, it was a childhood dream to like get these cars. I bought like a McLaren. I bought a Ferrari. I had this big house. I had like jet skis. I, I had like the dream, but I wasn't really happy. All the superficial stuff, like materialistic stuff didn't make me happy. So now I'm traveling and I'm like, okay, let me, let me actually like meet with some locals. Like, let me get some perspective. So in Bali, my driver, um, at this really nice resort called the Viceroy. Um, yeah. I, well, I've been to the Viceroy in uh, Cabo. Okay. Beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. Viceroy in, in Bali. Amazing. But we're seeing all this tourist stuff. I was like, his name is Dwee. I was like, Dwee, take me to your, your village. Right. And he's like, what? No, no one wants to go there. I was like, yes, I want to go there. So I'm meeting with his village, having like dinner with his you family. You weren't scared of like, you know, just crime or anything. Bali. I mean, like, like rich white guy. Yeah. I, it wasn't necessarily the smart. Like I, I've done some dumb stuff, right? Like, yeah. you know, okay. I could, that's a whole nother episode. Okay. Like dumb, rich white guy in other countries, <laughs> dumb stuff. Um, no, but like, you know, it Bali is, is a friendly place. And like, we're going into like these mountain villages is not, there's different, different things. I wouldn't necessarily do this like in India, uh, or like Vietnam or like, I've, I've been to some, some places where you don't do this Bali. I felt safer. Um, anyways, I meet his family. 
you know, when we try to build a school, like I was like, what do you guys need? Like they need education. Most of the kids in this, the village can't like read or write. So I was like, oh, let's build a school. So I started looking up for schools. There's a charity called Bali Children's Project. Long story short, it didn't work in his village because of like some political issues with like the village leader. But I was like, oh, Bali Children's Project, let's build a school. At the time, they never really had uh, enough money for anything other than toys and like books. $25,000, sure, I'll donate it. So they have this whole list of like different prospective communities that want, um, you know, schools. So we built the first school in Bali, opened it in 2016, was amazing. Then I went to Laos, um, you know, going to third world countries really opens your, your mind up. Then we went to the Philippines. We just had our first school open there this year. Yeah, it's amazing. So one by one, you start seeing like what makes you happiest in life. Get the cars if that's like your dream. Try it out. Um, for me, it got old very yeah, quickly. Yeah, it it's not fulfilling. And now, now I get so much like fulfillment and enjoyment. I try to go to like the school grand openings. We're doing a documentary to really show off. Like people in first world countries, they don't even realize like how much of a gift schooling is. Yeah. Like kids take it for granted. Like, oh, I'm gonna cut class. I'm gonna skip it. Like there are kids who would love for any opportunity to learn. Like you have to understand in these countries before we build schools and we get them new toys and new stuff, like there's a coloring book. I went to one uh, prospective school. Like I like to go and announce that we're building a school too. Mm. And I go to this community. They have like, it's like a room this size, but it's, you know, there's a hundred kids and they're all like packed in. And I'm like, oh, let's see like what, what your supplies are like. There's a coloring book that I pick up and I open it up and I'm like horrified. A coloring book can basically be used once, maybe twice. Like you color it in and then yeah. that's it. The, every page is so shiny because they've been coloring it like 50 times. Wow. Like, because they don't have a second one. So like, that's, I mean, that's one example, but that's crazy to me, right? Like mm -hmm. that's not a, yeah. a good way to like learn. And these kids, even if they do go to school, they don't really have a curriculum. So they learn three things. They learn how to say, you know, one through 10. They know how to say A through Z and they know how to say the days of the week. Mm. That's it. Why do they, why do you think they know these three things? That's it. They're the most useful. For tourists. So uh, they try to say this in English so that they beg and the tourists are like cute, like Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and the kids are cute. So you give them $5. That's why they learn. So wow. they're being trained to be beggars, which is like no life at all. So now, you know, Bali Children's Project, we have other charities like Pencils of Promise. We have 20 plus schools with them. Uh, Build On, uh, Cambodia Village Project. Like there's all these different charities and they come out with curriculums and they give these kids like a chance to learn. Mm. So now it's turned into a full-time movement. How how much does it cost to build a school? Uh, different communities, but 25, 35, 50,000. Okay. And then for the charities, how are you guys raising money? So this is me. I mean, I'm, I donate my trading profits. Oh, <laughs> and you're just self-funding all these. Pretty much. Um, but again, like my partner sells his photographic prints. We sell some merch. Uh, we do some online fundraisers. You know, we have a million and a half followers on Instagram now. Mm. Um, Cause it's not just about the money. Like money alone can't solve a lot of this stuff. A lot of it is just like spreading awareness. Um, so our online community did, did a really good job in Yemen. Uh, there was um, a whole uh, famine going on. So we raised like half a million dollars online and then I matched it with a half a million for my trading profits. Mm, so that's amazing. Yeah, it's good I stuff. I love that. So you're just in the Philippines. You're telling me I have to go. I got to go see the native land. You do. I, I haven't been yet, but I, I just, I, I do, I agree with you. I think for me, I haven't been exposed to it in that kind of way. And I think, it'll definitely change my heart and my mindset on like just seeing it firsthand. It's eye opening and it's a perspective shift. Like, you know, I used to just travel like LA, Vegas, Miami, you know, New York, like, and I go around and around for meetings and different stuff like that. But that's right. a bubble, you know, like first world problems. Right. When you see what these people are having to do with, like it's rough. And we were in the Philippines last year. Uh, we went back just for like a clean water project because they have a lot of dirty water. Um, it's actually pretty cool. It's a Sawyer uh, water filter. It's like 50 bucks. Campers use it like if you want to drink out of streams, but we're using it now in third world countries and it's cleaning all the water supply because you know 50% of the diseases are waterborne illnesses. Mm -hmm. Big problem in the Philippines and other countries. Anyways, we're supposed to stay in the Philippines for two weeks, but we hadn't been back since COVID. COVID destroyed like tourism, in Philippines and Bali, like they're very dependent on tourism. So mm. it was a lot worse. We ended up staying like a month and a half building a school. Um, now we're building a basketball court in, in the slums too. Mm. So we're trying different stuff. 
We have a soccer field in Cambodia. Uh-huh. The soccer field was double the expense of the school, but they built it in half the time because they wanted it so much. I went for the grand opening. I have like a film crew following me. I was like, oh, film me scoring a goal. The kids wouldn't even let me touch the ball. Like, I was like, this is my field. I built it. Uh-huh. Right? Like, this is, they loved it though. It was cool though because like they were playing so like competitively and it's like yeah. AstroTurf. So it's like extra fast. And I'm not funny. like that athletic, but I have like the film crew. They're like, Tim, you got to touch the ball. And I'm like trying to catch up with the kids and they're just, crushing me it's fun <laughs> dude that's awesome no so you you go to these countries and it like it opens your mind up and then also when you come back you're more grateful for everything that you have like you look at like you know your your water like this cup of water you look at it differently you look at a cup of like coffee differently you look at like you know just air conditioning everything's different. everything's changed the perspective it's, is totally it's beautiful different. it's a beautiful feeling so that's why we're doing this documentary a lot of people can't go to third world countries we're trying to show it to them mm. And are you going to try and like get it on Netflix or something? Maybe. I don't know. We've done two documentaries. uh, One on uh, Save the Reef, Coral Reefs. Uh, we have 15 million views on YouTube. Mm. Um, and then we did one in on rhinos in South Africa because they're killing rhinos for the wrong reasons. Do you know about that? No. This is what pisses me off. So it's like misinformation. I hate penny stock misinformation. I hate crypto misinformation. <laughs> I hate rhino misinformation. So they have these like these horns, right? Yeah. Like it's like a, a, a tusk or something. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, elephants have tusks and like rhinos have tusks. Same kind of thing. Elephant tusks are actually made out of ivory. So there's value to that. Like you know, it shouldn't be, but like there's value in like jewelry and stuff like that. Rhino horns, guess what it's made out of? It's one ingredient. I don't know. Keratin. It's what's in our fingernails. Okay. No medicinal purposes, no decorative purposes, no anything. It's a freaking fingernail. It's just on a rhino. Unfortunately, a myth has been spread that rhino horn is an aphrodisiac. It cures cancer. It cures COVID. So there's a whole black cures market. COVID. There's a whole black market where it's like rhino horn and they grind it up and you drink it and you think that you're, you're stronger. Total lie. There's literally nothing in it. Rhinos a decade ago, two decades ago, weren't even endangered. Now there's only a few thousand left because they're killing all the rhinos to get to their horns. Like I was holding a horn literally like the size of this glass and it's worth like $75,000. What? That's Just how, because people perceive because, its value. Yeah. And now it's even worse. Like, you know, the worst thing is that now in China, this has become a, a recent custom where if there's an elder on their deathbed, um, how do you show that you love your elder so much when they're dying the family pulls their money together and buys a rhino horn to give to the elder to take you know to the afterlife and they literally bring the the horn to the elder's bedside and they see the horn and like theoretically the more money they spend that's how much they love the elder and so it's like so there's a bidding war now for the biggest horns and it's like doubled prices. This was never a problem even a decade or two ago. And now rhinos, like they're the most gentle, beautiful creatures, but they're also just not going to let you take their horns. Like right. there's a way to do it. So we actually did a documentary where like, it's basically like, you know, filing your fingernails. Like we actually did this mission where we sedated this rhino. How do you sedate a rhino? It's a multi-ton animal. They actually had to shoot a dart from a helicopter to like just tranquilize it. Mm. And then you can like, cut off its horn in a safe way. It's like they have a chainsaw, but it's basically doing it in a humane, safe way. You know, it will grow back. The rhino wakes up, no horn, no risk of poaching because the poachers don't want to deal with like a multi-ton animal with no horn. All they want is a horn. Yeah, yeah. There's no value to the rhino itself. Unfortunately, you know, the poachers just go after the horn. And so there's heartbreaking videos where you see rhinos with like basically their whole head cut off. The baby rhino is left because the poachers have no value for it. So the baby rhino is now an orphan. So we sponsor these rescue centers now in Africa because they take care of these, these babies that have lost their parents. Like there's a video, I was bawling my eyes out when I first saw it. The baby doesn't know that the mom is dead. You know, the baby doesn't yeah. understand. So the baby's trying to like suckle milk mm. and it's baby rhino squeak. And so the baby's squeaking and there's a photographer taking video of this and just documenting it all. And he's crying too. Cause wow. the baby's like trying to suckle for milk. The mom is just there like dead because they took her horn. This is what we're doing. And it's not just rhinos. Elephants are endangered. Now giraffes are endangered. They cut off the tail. They cut off the horns. Like it's, it's all due to superstitious BS. So mm. if we can get good information out there, we can help these animals mm. and help the planet too. That's super sad, dude. So it's, it, it all blends in, right? Like you want to save the forest. There's an animal called pangolins. Have you heard of pangolins? No. Not penguins, pangolins. 
Look it up. P-A-N-G-O-L-I-N-S, right? These are little mammals. It's the most hunted ammo, uh, mammals. They have scales. Again, the scales are made out of keratin. But people take them, they eat the scales, they grind them up, same kind of thing as rhino horn. Mm. The problem with this is that they're not just a cute animal, they're actually known as protectors of the forest. Every pangolin eats an estimated 10,000 bugs, insects per day. They wow. have these tongues that go crazy. It's actually pretty insane, right? We're killing the protectors of the forest because if the pangolins die, which they're doing, they're being killed in the millions per year, now no one is eating all the insects. The insects population is now growing and they're destroying the forests. So it's wow. like, we're killing our forests, we're killing our animals. So when you see this stuff, like, I don't know how not to help, especially now that I have knowledge and now we have a good social media community. Mm. So, well, also too, the hard part with misinformation is just with <laughs> every social media platform, you just don't know what's true. And it's just, um, it's interesting to watch what Elon's doing with Twitter to see if he can get just all the information out there. It's it's tough. It's like a never ending battle. I mean, I I battle like penny stock promoters and I'm like, look at all these historical examples. Like there's never been a penny stock pump. When I call out like a promoter or a, a pump where there's like 20 promoters, it never succeeds. It And I have like tens of thousands of examples and I send this to these newbies and they're like, no, I don't believe you. I was like, just look, just look. <laughs> I have all the data. I feel like did you see I Am Legend with Will Smith, yep. you know, and the zombies are crushing in and he's like, just wait, I can save all of you. Yeah. That's how I feel with like penny stock people and crypto and NFTs and they don't listen. But when they lose enough, this is, this is the, the hope for mankind. When you lose enough, you start to open your mind. So I can't save them from their first big loss, yeah, yeah, yeah. but I can warn them and then they remember who warned them. And I get emails like, hey, Tim, I should have listened to you. I just lost all my money, you know what do I do now? And I'm like, oh, <laughs> well, you should save up and study. But you know, I have 1700 free YouTube videos. Like I, I'm trying to warn people ahead of time because right. I see how this ends and it's just sad. Yeah. No, super crazy. So with trading penny stocks, um, do you see it as just, uh, kind of like a hustle to start making money for like people who have a couple thousand dollars or like, who's the ideal person to start going yeah. on penny stocks? Listen, it could be a hustle. You know, people, I have part-time students, full-time students. It's really just understanding how finance works, understanding how hype works. You know, like penny stocks is just one asset class. Like NFTs and crypto really aren't that different. Part of the reason why I didn't do crypto or NFTs is because it's 24-7. I sleep very little as it is. <laughs> I don't want that. Um, and the unregulated stuff, you know, scares me. If you lose all your money, like in the stock market, you're, you're insured. FTX, all gray area because it's like yeah. overseas. You're not insured. And it's like FTX, US was supposed to be protected, but is it? Very sketchy stuff. Um, listen, it, whether you like penny stocks or, you know, baseball cards or, or Pokemon, like it's, it's learning that when you have a small dollar amount, you should not be investing in blue chip companies. Like people are like, you know, there's these acorn accounts and like, oh, let me add one share. And they're trying to make this money like in a very gradual way over like decades. When you have these little manias and bubbles popping up where if you ride it, even for just a little bit, whether it's penny stocks, whether it's crypto, whether it's NFTs, like you can grow your account exponentially. So like if you have a thousand dollars, I'm not saying put all into any one stock again, like it's risky. You can be wrong anytime. I'm still wrong a third of the time. I should bring that up. Rule number one for me is cut losses quickly. So you need an exit plan, but at the same time, you got to recognize how do you use your small account to your advantage? Mm. I like penny stocks because we know how it ends. It's not like, you know, Tesla. You're not guessing on like the actual companies. <laughs> we know it's going to go down and yeah. zero. Well, hundred percent. Like it's, it's like going to see a movie where you know the ending and then you can kind of like play it back when you start seeing different plot points. Right. Like we see how penny stocks, they don't just end up at zero. Like there's different points along the way, whether they get suspended by the SEC, whether the promoter goes bust, whether like the, the ad money of the promo just runs out. But like there's very specific ways and it's kind of cool to be able to track the whole boom and bust. Mm. So I think it's good to learn. I think it's good to earn. You know, you just have to recognize the limitations. Like the best penny stock traders in the world only make a few million a year, which to most people is good. But like in Wall Street, it's like a joke. Like people right. still think I'm like a joke. They're like, oh, you're still doing penny stocks after 20 plus years. And I'm like, yeah. 
you know? <laughs> like it's it's really good for people with small accounts. But it, if you have like billions, like, it's useless. It sounds like the reason you like penny stocks and crypto and NFTs is just the volatility. It seems like it's very difficult to do with normal stocks. hundred percent. Like it's, I, I have a love and hate relationship with the promoters. I'm like, you know, thank you for creating this opportunity. Thank you for being so shady. Thank you for selling your soul to the devil. <laughs> like enjoy eternal hellfire. But at the same time, thank you for the predictability. Like it's, Without the promoters, without the predictability, what am I? I'm trying to guess the value of the companies. That's really tough. Yeah. You know, the only way to make money in that is decades, Warren Buffett style. I don't have that patience. Right. So like, I like predictable setups. Right now, as we're filming this, I have zero positions, 100% cash. People are like, oh, you're, you're diverse. Nope, I'm not diversified. The US dollar is pretty strong, thankfully. Did, do you do any of like the chart analysis and stuff like that? Yeah, I mean, I use charts. I, I like the patterns to a degree, though, because sometimes it's a fake out, right? So sometimes like promoters will create a technical breakout. So like a stock hits a new 52 week high on huge volume. The message boards all go crazy because they're like, it hit the scan. It's a 52 week high. But the promoters made that happen. And then it's just a fake out to suck people in. And that's actually like the top. So sometimes like you buy the exact top. I don't like buying like a brick wall. Man, do the promoters ever get burned? It seems like they're always, because since they're kind of controlling it. I, I don't know. You have to ask them. Like, I'll tell you this. This was a crazy story. So I only have like theories about promoters. I don't, I don't know promoters. Like I just react to the price action that I see them like when they send emails or in their chat rooms and stuff like that. One time I was on Skype. This was crazy. You know, there's like Skype groups. Yeah. I didn't know this. One time I got invited to a Skype group and it said like promoters and payers. And I was like, what is this? I click it and there's like 500 people in there and they're like, literally promoters and like companies saying like, Hey, I'll offer you, you know, 2 million shares at 0 0.001. And I see this whole Skype group. And I was like, what, what, what is this? And I'm like scrolling through and it's all different promoters being offered deals. And some are saying yes. And then like I was there for 30 seconds and then someone's like, who let Sykes in? And they're like, block him, get him out. Uh -huh. And it was out. And I was like, what did I just see? It was like <laughs> pulling back the curtain on like this whole promoter world. And How did all, you get in it? They're all talking. One of the promoters, I think, was probably like fighting and it was like, screw this. I'm going to bust all of you. Sykes is going to get in here. <laughs> and I was just like, it was like, uh, what was that movie with Matt Damon, uh, The Adjustment Bureau? Oh, where it's yeah, like, yeah. you know, and this is like, you see behind the scenes. this is what's happening. So that was the one time I saw behind the scenes. So there, I don't know if they still exist. Like maybe it's a WhatsApp group or whatever, but like there are people out there pulling the strings. So yeah. if I see a chart breakout, I like it. I recognize that that's going to bring in some buyers, but I'm always like cautious. Right. I'm always cautious, right? Like I'm literally ask the trading industry and be like, oh, Sykes trades like a bitch. Like he's like a little <laughs> coward. Like I have in my DVD, in one of my DVDs, I talk like with a Mickey Mouse voice. I'm, I say I'm a castrated choir boy. I'm like, I'm going to buy this stock, but I have no balls. So it's a small position. Like, and I literally keep this up. Like uh, I really want to teach safety in volatile markets. The problem is most people are aggressive in volatile markets and they lose everything. Right. And they like the adrenaline rush. So like when you hear about penny stocks, oh, everyone loses, they go bust because mm. they believe the promoters. What if you don't believe the promoters? What if you start looking into the patterns? What if you start trading them conservatively and you make a few hundred? My average trading gain is just around $2,000. Mm. It's not much. Right. But for a multimillionaire, like people, I post all my trades. People are like, you made $300 today. You're a multimillionaire. You're proud of $300. I was like, yeah, this is what I do. I was, I'm up on stage. I get speaking gigs because like I have a loud personality. I'm up on stage with these billionaire traders and like some of the most respected <laughs> traders in the world. And the literally stock guy. I was a little late and I was trading this penny stock. I made $375, right? And remember all of this gets donated. It doesn't matter where I make 375 or 3000, but I teach the process. And I was so happy to make 375. I nailed it. It was a small position. It was like a $2,000 position. I made like, you know, 15% in like 10 minutes. I was like, awesome. I'm up on stage talking. And I was explaining this trade and they're like, you can't, and one of the billionaires says, you, you can't put that much money in this. I was like, I just made 375. He's like, only 375,000? And I was like, no, $375. Like he thought 375,000 was small. <laughs> and I only made $375. Like, it's just a perspective shift, right? <laughs> Even my top student, my newest top student, Jack Kellogg, I was like, come back to OTCs. OTCs are like penny stocks. He's now trading NASDAQs and all these big plays. He's, he's having big wins, but bigger losses. I was like, come back to OTCs. They're easier. And he's like, no, you can only make five or $10,000 a day. This is a guy who was a former valet, like getting like $20 tips a few years ago. Now he, lo he looks down on penny stocks, yeah. making five or 10,000. And I know, 
you know, most of the people listening, like they would love to make five or 10,000 a day. So it's all just perspectives. The billionaires and the millionaires, they want more. Yeah. These people, you know, should just aim for singles. Making a few hundred or a few thousand changes your life over time. Right. So that's yeah. what I try to, I try to bridge because I, I see all the different perspectives. Yeah. No, it makes complete sense. Do you think that, um, I mean, I don't know if stocks, because I'm, I wasn't tracking them as much, definitely not penny stocks. But do you think they were as much of a run as like this whole crypto and NFT boom last time? Uh, so I would say half and half because with COVID, the stimulus checks mainly went into like Robinhood accounts. At the yeah. time- Were Rob you trading GameStop? No. So I, I didn't even do the meme stocks, but that's the same kind of thing. So like the stimulus checks all went into Robinhood or some other brokers, but Robinhood was the main beneficiary. Robinhood doesn't do OTC stocks or okay. they didn't do it. So we didn't get the huge benefit that a lot of cryptos and, and NFTs did. Um, but again, we, we definitely got booms. Like I, I can show you a hundred charts of stocks that were trading at one one hundredth of a penny and they went to like 50 cents right? or 30 cents. And on a chart, you're like, oh, it's only 30 cents, but it's like up a thousand times. Right. So that's what you're looking for. You're looking for the percentage gain. So with, well, I guess too, you gotta, it's gotta have enough liquidity. But uh, I mean, some of these penny, like we only trade actively traded penny stocks. The problem with my print at home ticketing, it was very illiquid stock. Even though the print at home ticketing worked, I had such a big position because I was funding the company, I couldn't get out. Mm. So now like, again, that's a lesson learned. I, I lost basically half a million dollars of my biggest personal loss. My hedge fund lost a million. Everyone thought I lost everything. I lost all my industry credibility. Now I never go into illiquid stocks. I never take too big of a position that I can't get, a, get out of very quickly. Right. That makes sense. This is the problem with NFTs and crypto too, because even though they're open 24 seven, there's a lot of illiquidity, mm -hmm. you know, it might get shut down. Like there's, there's just stuff like you can't control your risk that much. Right. So if you can't control your risk, I don't know how to take the trade. Right. I always think about what's my max risk. Like my average win is only 2000. My average loss is 500. Mm. So I need to be sure that I can take that $500 loss. Right. I don't care if there's something you say, oh, you can make a million, but like the risk is you lose like 4 million. Right. Like I can't do that. It's a very slippery slope. And yeah. I was having this conversation with two of my top students the other day where they're making 2000, 5000, 10,000, like Jack Kellogg was. Yeah. And I was like, just take it slow. This is very good. Remember your former life just five years ago, you had nothing, yeah. but they want more. Once you start making five or 10,000 in a day, you want more, like how far can you take it? I'm fortunate that I know my limitations in myself as a trader. If I can make a few thousand dollars a day, I'm done. That's it. Sometimes I, I've made more. I've made a hundred thousand in a day before, but like very rarely, right. you know, I just, I like the small amounts because again, I also have perspective because now since I'm building schools and I know it costs 25, 35,000 to build a school, if I can make like, am I willing to lose that? Exactly. Right. Cause now I see these kids and it's like hundreds of kids. So it's like, what are you going to use your money for? But a lot of traders just have too much money. It doesn't really matter. They're just buying bottles at clubs. Right. I used to buy bottles at clubs, you know? I, I used to spend yeah. five or ten thousand dollars when I had no soul. <laughs> then I grew a soul. Then you grew a soul. Well, I found these I, kids I and... found fulfillment, right? Yeah. So like you have to find what fulfills you. Right. Um, it's very rare to find fulfillment in a bottle at a nightclub. You you will not. You 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 could find temporary fulfillment, but you will not find permanent. And that's the thing. And that's the same thing with like the Lambos. It's the same thing with like all the, the luxury stuff. So like you just have to like go through it. I'm not saying like, oh, I'm anti-luxury, like don't get a car, don't get like if that drives you, if that motivates you, if it makes you happy, fantastic. But in my experience, it's very short-term um, thinking. For right. me, building a school, yes, we're educating a few hundred kids now, but every year in the future too. So when we build a school, we're getting future generations. And then it lifts up the whole community. So like yeah. a rising tide lifts all boats. When like the whole stock market is going crazy, three out of four stocks follow the market. When a community starts getting educated, I don't know, we'll see what's possible. I've only been doing this a few years. Right. Yeah, I think the impact's going to be crazy. So, you know, you you said you did a presentation last uh, year with your construction hat and you said, hey, the market's crashing, be prepared. And obviously it has. Uh, what, what's your prediction for 2023? Um, so I say 2020, 2021 was like a giant party. 2022 is like a hangover. We have like the spins. Like if you drink a lot, you know, you ever get the spins. Mm -hmm. Have you done that? Uh, I mean, I've, I've spun before and I go to sleep. <laughs> It's really annoying though. So you party, it's all fun. Then you have the hangover. Then you have like this, you know, your, your body needs to recover. 
So I make that analogy and I say, we're in like recovery mode. The problem is, this is the biggest problem. There's so much leverage and there's so much interconnected loans. Like the fact that Tesla's busting, the fact that FTX busted, like those aren't the only ones, right? So Warren Buffett has a great quote, like where, you know, when the tide goes out, then you see who's been swimming naked. The tide is going out and we don't know how many companies have problems. I guarantee you it's not just FTX or Tesla. A lot of companies are over leveraged. A lot of traders are over leveraged. You don't know how bad it gets. Mm -hmm. So everyone's trying to predict the bottom like, oh, Q2 2023. Uh, Elon Musk just did like a, on the All In podcast. He just came on. Did you watch that? Mm -mm. It's pretty crazy. Do you watch the All In podcast? No. It's pretty cool. It's like four billionaires talking. One of them, you know, is at the Twitter headquarters. Elon just comes in and he's just like talking. He's like shooting the shit. Like it's oh, crazy. I'll have to so, check that out. Yeah, it was a two hour. Who's the host? Um, so there's four guys: um, Chamath, David Sachs, uh, Freelander, um, Freeland. I don't know. Okay. It, you know. Yeah, I'll check it out. Um, Jason Calacanis is is like the main host. But Elon comes in and he basically said that he's expecting a recession through. I think it was like Q2, uh, 2024. So like we basically have like another year, year and a half. And the problem is like, you don't know how bad it gets. Elon brought up a, a thing on the, the podcast where he said like Broadcom is a good company and it had like a 97% drop during that last recession, like over a decade ago. So even good companies can drop 90%. So like you want to try to find the bottom. Why? So for me, I like sitting in cash. I don't know how ugly it's going to get, you know, mm -hmm. when, when you thing, don't have a prediction. No, I, I, so this Thrive conference, I just said, I think there's going to be a big drop. I have the hard hat on because I don't know when it's going to happen. I didn't know that I was like, I mean, this was when Bitcoin was at 60,000. I didn't know how dead on I was yeah. going to be. Um, I just said hard hat just in case. Now I say sit on the sidelines and wait. Like you very rarely get a V-shaped recovery, like where you have a big drop and then a big bounce. Right, right. Usually there's going to be a catalyst. What catalyst do we have on the, the horizon? We have a food crisis. We have an energy crisis. <laughs> we have geopolitical risk. Is there going to be war with uh, North Korea? Is there going to be war with China? Is there going to be war with Russia? Like there's so many negatives and no positives. Right. And like the debt is so much. Like there was a chart posted the other day. Someone posted it where it was like, uh, personal savings rates has like dropped like 90% and credit card loan is like way at the highs. Like what happens when people start defaulting? A lot of like homes and real estate, right? Like you have rising rates. I saw like the average mortgage in like Austin where it was like 1300 in a month. Now it's like over 3000 in the month. Like what happens to this stuff? I don't know, but it's ugly. So I should have worn my my hard hat. I saw you wear your construction <laughs> yeah, outfit. My, I you have did it right it better. there, dude. We, you we could have got you the, the hard hat right now. I did it first. I time stamped it <laughs> last November. You actually had a better one though. I just had like my my assistant go out and get me one and it's crap. Yours is like more <laughs> colorful. Yeah. But no, I I uh you know, looking at everything, it's interesting, right? Because uh real estate has slowed down, but it has not crashed, right? Yet. Yet. And stocks and everything have stocks, crypto, everything else. Well, crypto's down 70, 80, 90%. Stocks are only down. I mean, the Dow is only like 12% off its highs. Like it's crazy. The Dow is held up. The NASDAQ might be down 35%, but like okay. aside from tech, but tech, you also have to figure tech got a big boom due to COVID. So, so of course it's going to come down harder. Like Zoom, Peloton, um, all the, the, the yeah, COVID yeah, names killed. are getting crushed, but the Dow is only 12%. So it's like, we're not like, people are like, oh, yeah. this is such a tough year. It's got to be over soon. No, it doesn't. Like sometimes there's been like a lost decade before. Like if you look at historical comps, like there's many different valuations where we're still overvalued. Mm. So I just stay safe. Like there will be opportunities. There will be another boom. Hopefully, you know, some actual real world usage of NFTs and crypto for the next boom. Right. But like, you just don't have to jump in right away. And as recent Tesla dip buyers have learned, like 180 is the bottom, 150 is the bottom, 120 is the, like, it's really tough to try to, you know, catch a falling knife. Right. So I make these real world analogies. I don't want to do this on video, but like, if you're like juggling knives and you're trying to catch it, like you won't always catch the handle, you know? Yeah. So this is kind of like a falling knife. So cash is king. Mm. And the US dollar has been strong. I just got like a nice little 30% off trip. I just went to Japan too. 30% off last year. Europe is 25% off. Go mm. where the sales are. <laughs> so are you uh, buying anything? Uh, like, do you have any long-term investments, real estate? Zero. You I just, bought my parents a place. So like I moved my parents down from Connecticut to Miami, bought them three places actually right mm -hmm. next to each other, combined them. Um, 
So the only assets you own are really like your business and yeah, that's about now it. Now I got charity merch. I spent a quarter of a million dollars on that merch handmade in Peru. Yeah. <laughs> we, we helped the whole uh, village. We, we filmed it too. All these women are like making it. So that was kind of cool. Um, you don't have to be invested all the time. I know like, I'm like, I'm the penny stock guy. So I'm already crazy, but like, you don't need to be diversified. You don't need to be invested all the time. I really think that you can be like tactical, especially when you have a small account. I know people with like a $5,000 account and they have like 30 positions. They're like, I have this, this hedge, this hedge. I was like, you have like no money. Like what are you going to make? Like $15 on a position? Yeah. If you have I, a small account, like trade like a sniper, take one position, not go all in, but like one or two positions. Yeah. I tell people that all the time when they're like, dude, I got a couple thousand bucks. What should I do? I'm like, you should definitely not just buy stocks and buy and hold. Like you're going to make a hundred bucks. Like that ain't going to do anything for you. hundred percent. But know? they, but then again, they want to be, they want to be Warren Buffett, right? So like you think, oh, penny stocks have such a bad name. Now crypto has a bad name. NFTs have a bad name because if you're trading them aggressively, it's going to go badly. Like if you're driving a Ferrari 300, 200 miles an hour in a 35 mile an hour zone, it's not going to go well. But you know, when I had my Ferrari, I would drive extra slow. I actually, I tested out, you know, like the Vegas uh, Speedway here, yeah. like where you can test out exotic yeah. cars. Like I didn't know which car to get my first time. So I flew out to Vegas and I was driving all the cars and I was seeing like which exotic I like the most. Yeah. And you're supposed to drive fast and I'm going like 30, 40 miles an hour. <laughs> and the guy next to me is like, you got to go faster. I was like, no, no, I'm testing this out. He's like, what are you doing? You can go slow in an exotic car. You can like not invest for like a month or a year. Like it's, it's crazy these assumptions and these misguided assumptions that people have because they're trying to be like Warren Buffett or they're trying to be like somebody else. And they're not realizing that with a small dollar amount, like you can't do much. You have to be very tactical. Mm -hmm. I have a whole video lesson where I say like trade like a sniper, like you're, you're sitting up there and you're waiting for your one shot. Mm -hmm. You don't just, you don't have a machine gun. You don't have all these like different things that you can do, right? Like choose one or two. So right. I think that's how you grow it. This is how like my top students have grown a few thousand into a few million being very tactical. That's it. And that's right now too, because I, like, I, I just have a bad feeling about 2023, especially we're filming this. I don't know when you're going to post it, but we're filming January, this yep. the end of 2022. Right. There should be a Santa Claus rally right now. The last few days of the trading year, almost all the time it outperforms. There's no Santa Claus rally happening right now. We're down almost every day, which is even scarier. And if you look at how like Santa Claus rallies can predict the future, when there's no Santa Claus rally, the next year is very bad. Mm. So especially the beginning of 2023, like I'm just scared. And, and we haven't had true panic yet. Again, a lot of people are living based off the value of their homes. Homes have dropped a little bit, but not much. What happens if it drops more? Then it's like this whole momentum, uh, like this boulder of debt that just like grows bigger and bigger. And it's like an avalanche. Yeah. The weird thing with real estate right now is, and I, I kind of predicted this was like, hey, even if things start crashing, um, people aren't going to sell, right? Because they're locked into these low mortgage rates. They're they're locked into a low payment. Rents are still high. So they don't have a better alternative. Like, and if they go underwater, they definitely can't sell. You know, so it's like there's this weird dynamic happening where buyer demand has really fallen off. Yeah. But seller supply is now going down. Yeah. Because people are like, no, I'm not. Why, why would I sell? Yeah. It's tricky, right? <laughs> yeah. Like it's, I don't know, you know, I'm not real estate at all, but I do know how much people have invested in their homes. Yeah. And they've put a lot of money into that. Yeah. And that's kind of like the last. That's the last thing to let go. Yeah. So it's like. It's illiquid, unlike the stocks. So, yeah. So I just don't know, right? Like, you, you know, you ask me like, oh, I'm a talking head. Like, you know, I used to be on CNBC and they're like, okay, come with like 17 stock picks. I'm like, I don't have 17. Like, I think there's one or two good plays. Like, you don't always need to be invested. You don't always need a good play. It's okay to say that you don't know. Yeah. And you sit back and you wait. I know very specific patterns. I wait for my patterns. I'm watching Tesla. I'm just making popcorn watching Tesla every day. I'm not trading it as I shouldn't be. Friday, I broke my rules and I traded it. I have to be more disciplined. So you will trade normal stocks too. I will, but I, I'm like, I really don't want to. So like sometimes normal stocks follow penny stock patterns. Like right now, Tesla is following a penny stock pattern. A lot of my top students traded uh, GameStop and AMC because even though they were higher priced, they traded like my, I have a seven step framework and like it, it follows it. And it's crazy because, you know, it shouldn't be this like, not predictable, but like it shouldn't follow a penny stock pattern. Right. These are real companies. These are big companies, but every now and then they do. 
Um, like Nicola, I don't know if you know yep. Nicola Motors. Yeah. The guy blocked me before he got arrested. Because <laughs> um, I was calling him out and his promoters, like this thing went to over a hundred, right? It went yeah. from like five to a hundred and it fit like my seven step framework. The top is like a, a classic number four waiting for a crash. And I was, and he had like this promoter, I forget the guy's name, I think it was Alex or something on Twitter. And Alex is saying, this is the next Tesla, don't sell, only the weak sell. One guy sold and the whole little community piled on him like, you're weak, you paper hands best, <laughs> right? And that actually turned out to be the best thing. I was like, when other people are telling you not to sell, that's usually a good time to sell <laughs> because they're trying not to like collapse their house of cards, right. which Nicola did collapse and selling at anywhere in like the 80s to 100, that's a fantastic sell. So I see these patterns on higher price stocks like Tesla. I don't know. You know, we'll see if it goes under 100. Like I'm, I'm waiting for That'd max panic. It could. Like I didn't think that it would get is 107 after hours. Like I saw it this morning at 113. And I was like tempted to dip by it, but I'm like, no, 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 no. I have to like, I want to wait. So this is kind of like my my weird way of thinking where I think of myself as a retired trader. Even though I'm trading almost every day, the mindset of me being a retired trader and only coming out of retirement for plays that I think are so good, I would feel guilty missing it. And mm. you're like, what are you talking about? Like, this is so like backwards, but it's true. If I say I don't have to trade, I don't need to trade. I don't want to trade. Luckily, I, I travel a lot. So I usually have like some fun adventure. I'm like jet lagged. Like I'm, I'm on like three hours sleep right now. I don't know if you <laughs> can tell, right? No. I was like spilling, I was like spilling water on your desk. I was like, I'm sorry <laughs> about that. Um, when I'm living life, I don't want to trade. Right. And that has made me a better trader because then I can be more patient. The number one problem that traders have is they're jumping into this, they're jumping into that. They're in a bad trade. A good trade pops up. They can't get out. Mm. Then they get out of their trade to go into this trade and it's the wrong one. It's like changing lanes on like a highway full of traffic. And you're like, this lane, this lane, but this lane. What do you lane. do when you're a trader and you're on tilt? <laughs> I've never had that. You just always just get in, get out. I, I literally, sometimes I've been on fire like in 2021, like there were so many penny stocks spiking. And now looking back in hindsight, I took my profits too carefully, but I was making like 20, 30,000 a day, which was a lot for me. Yeah. One day I was with three of my top students and we're like, uh, I like to surprise them when they crossed over a million. One of my students crossed over a million in San Diego. He's a vegetarian. So we all dress as vegetables. <sighs> I know we're corny. Anyways, we're there dressed as vegetables trading on like his kitchen counter. And that day I had made over 50,000, which was like a big day for me. Yeah. And I was like, I had like 10 positions. Like that was, I was pushing it. I alert every trade, right? So like I have to like make the trade then i write out my whole paragraphs like it's a, a lot of work it's not just trading like my students yeah but my student jack who crossed over 10 million and he's been making 50 100k a day a lot and he looked at me and he like condescendingly he's like good job like i made over 50k for a day and he's like yeah. looking down on me because he was up like 100 and i was like screw you you <laughs> former valet like <laughs> but like even when there's a hot market i have trouble being aggressive. Right. That's just my, the gift and the curse of, of who I am. Right. My students, the way that they become successful is being aggressive later on. But at first they don't know what they don't know. So like in the beginning, I think like right now, if you ask me like, what should people do? People are like ready to take notes. Like, what should I buy? I don't, I don't buy anything. Invest in your education. Yeah. Like during a slow time, this is when you should be studying the past more. Like you should learn all you, these historical comps. I have 8,000 yeah. video lessons, right? So I'm like, watch them all. Watch them all twice. I have 15 DVDs. Watch them all. Learn about history. I, I like, don't know if any new students are going to be able to find a DVD player. Or <laughs> so you'd be surprised. So <laughs> literally 5% of my students request hard copy DVDs. I didn't even know. I don't even have like a DVD, like yeah. it's, it's streaming, but like we still print them. We still <laughs> ship them. There's like a giant box that people get. <laughs> That's crazy. It's crazy. But I, again, yeah. I'm like a glorified history teacher. Some people are like, oh, I don't want to watch a DVD from 10 years ago or a video less. I'm like, history repeats. It might not be an exact science, but like yeah. the more you learn about history, the better prepared you are. No, I agree. I, uh, I tell this to people all the time. They're like, you know, if I got a couple thousand bucks, I'm like, you should definitely not invest in anything other than yourself. Like it's, that's it. Go learn to flip houses, go learn to trade penny stocks, go learn to start a business. Like, but do not invest in a passive income thing. People don't want to put in the time to learn. They just want fast money. This yeah. is like social media, instant gratification BS. Mm -hmm. And you don't get fast money unless you're just doing dumb speculative stuff, and then it's exciting because you're lucky. like, you'll, you'll get popped. 
Cause you're like, the odds don't apply to me, right? Like I'm special. My mom told me I was special. Look, I just did this special trade that proves it. My mom was right. I'm like, your mom is a liar. I say this to people. I was like, your mom was lying. You're not special. You're your all the average. You. You're all the average. Like it's, uh, it's crazy how people want that special feeling. It's not even just about the money. They want the exhilaration. They want the dopamine hit. Right. You need to separate it and you turn it into like a cold, cold business. Hmm. And it's not as much fun, but it's it makes you wealthier. Then you get to have fun. Right. That makes sense. Well, bro, it's been great meeting you, man. I appreciate you coming out to Vegas and hanging out. We'll have to do it again. And uh, man, I might have to jump on Tesla here if if you give me the go. And and we'll and we'll see what happens, dude. Just just wait. We don't know how low it's going to go. I'll 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 give you the go on the Philippines. That's what you need to do. Yeah, I'm going to the Philippines. We're marking this down. You're coming to the Philippines. You're going to see your people. You're going to see these projects. You're going to come back with a new perspective. It's going to be beautiful. I'm gonna. 20, I can already see it. I'm committing. 2023. I'm going to the Philippines. Beautiful. So Tarana. we're in. I said Tarana at the beginning of this. You don't I, even I, know what that means. I don't know any Tagalog. So Taraga means let's go. Taraga. Tarana. Tarana. Shoot, did I get it wrong? I don't know. Damn it. It's but, one of those. But we're going to go. I know Tarana. Vominos. Tarana. Yeah. Same so. kind of thing. <laughs> Same kind of thing. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, no, it would be cool to see that and then, you know, video it and then you can show your audience too. That's what it's all about. Like, because we built 50 schools in Bali, but my social media followers have built another 53. Wow. You know, which is cool because we post photos and videos and now worldwide I'm at 115, but my goal is a thousand. So well, got to keep it going. Yeah. I'm happy to promote and, and help you get there, bro. Cool. So I'm excited about it. Good to meet you guys. Make sure uh, you follow Tim and we'll catch you guys in the next episode. Peace. Hey, I hope you enjoyed that podcast. Thanks for making it to the end. The good news is I've got another one that I know you're going to like, and all you got to do is click it right here, linking it right here. All you got to do is just click it and you're going to see this new episode that you're going to love.